Well, it's good to have everyone out here today. Welcome to our uh, first, what we call the Eye of the Executives. It's part of PO leadership. We run these Eye of the Executives four times a year. It has been a long two years since we've actually had our last Eye of the Executive. So once again, thank you for coming today. Obviously, I've got a very special guest sitting beside me. Let me do a quick introduction. And I think everyone already knows very much about Stephen, but there were a few things that I thought I'd share that maybe you didn't know. Well, the first one is born and raised in Oshawa. Stephen was the first member of his family to attend university. In fact, he went to Queen's University and the elective was economics. Well, it was the luckiest elective possible in terms of where you went with your career. On the side, what he was doing, because he ended with a scholarship and he, had, he worked three jobs to go to Queen's, he was a disc jockey. So I don't know if there's ever been a governor of the Bank of Canada that was a disc jockey or you called it a spin master or something. Anyway, graduated in economics, went off to the University of Western Ontario, and then we have, you know, the rest is history. He became a widely recognized ec economist with nearly 40 years of experience in the financial markets, forecasting and economic policy, including 35 years in the public sector, which ended with his role as the governor of the Bank of Canada. Prior to that, he spent time with the Export Development Canada, starting as their Chief Economist and later as their President and CEO. Stephen is a certified international trade professional and also a graduate of Columbia University's Senior Executive Program. He's been a visiting scholar at the IMF in Washington, D.C. and at the Economic Planning Agency in Tokyo. He is a frequent speaker and has taught economics at Western University, Concordia, and the Queen's School of Business. Today, Stephen is at Osler providing clients on their strategic guidance regarding their financial system, trade, and economic policy. This past February, Stephen, as many of you know, and I know you've all picked up the book, he wrote his first book, The Next Stage of Uncertainty and How the World Can Adapt to a Riskier Future. And this morning, uh, for those of you that read the news, he was nominated for the Shaughnessy Cohen Award. So congratulations, Stephen, on that. That's a huge feat. All right, so just from a logistical, I'm going to spend about 30 minutes. We're going to go back and forth with some Q&A. And then I really want to open it up to the audience and uh, let you ask your questions and really direct them to, to Stephen. Really want to thank Fo Focus Asset Management. And there's a number of you in the crowd, Greg, Ted, uh, James. Thank you for helping us put this on today. You're a real part of our PO leadership community and, and really allowing us to do what we do. Um, thank you again, Focus, on that. So. I'm going to start with an easy question, and then we can really get into this. So anyway, what motivated you to write this book? Well, uh, you're right. That, that is easy, I guess. Um, I mean, I, you know, everybody sort of thinks maybe someday I wouldn't mind writing a book. You kind of have that in your mind. Uh, it would have to be a retirement project, I can assure you, because there's no time for any of that nonsense when you're on the job. But... Um, when I when I retired, I thought, yeah, maybe I, maybe I could write a book, but uh, what would it be about? I, what I wanted to do is contribute to the conversation around long termism for corporate corporate objective setting. You know, so this sense that companies are just a very short term focus, get make the numbers. Okay, another quarter, make the numbers. Uh, you know, ten of those does not make a long term plan. You know? So. What could I bring to that conversation? And that would be to try and bring a framework that really was long-term in nature that they could use as a framework to have those conversations. That's how I kind of started out. Uh, the honest truth is that uh, I didn't tell anybody I was writing a book, uh, not even my wife. She did <laughs> ask me a few times, like, what are you working on all day? You're supposed to be retired. <laughs> <laughs> and well, you know, this is a COVID project, so who cares? It's not, we're not going to Hawaii or anything. And, uh, and so I, I, I was working away, and I just said, well, you know, I'm, work, I'm giving speeches here and there, so I'm, I'm working on a little thing on demographics that I can insert into my talks or, you know, industrial revolutions, that kind of thing. Because I thought, well, people say to you, well, now that you're retired, what are you doing? To say, oh, oh, I'm writing a book. It just sort of sounded a little pompous. <laughs> presumptuous at least, you know, because who knows if it would ever go anywhere, right? So I never even told Valerie until after uh, it was basically all done and, uh, and Amanda Lang took a look at it and told me, yeah, you, you can do this. So, so I, I don't know, it, it, uh, the motivation was that, but when I, once I got it, the, the bit in my teeth, 
uh, you needed motivation because it does take a lot of a lot more time than it looks. I admire writers so much now, like the people who actually have made their living year after year this way. Yeah. It's a really hard job. Yeah, but anyway, it's been, it turned out to be a lot of fun. No, it's great. It's absolutely great. So what you know, you talk about the longer term, and the, the one thing I did pick up in your book, then I'm going to come back to at the end as well, was it's sort of you wanted to. I got the sense that you want to provide individuals and leaders with a perspective. So I, we're looking outside the yeah. window. We see all these risks in front of our life, our everyday life. Yeah. And the challenge is that, we, you know, as leaders, you've got to start making decisions. You've got to create action plans. And I, I sense from the book and how you wrote it, it was really a tool for us to think about in terms of how do we make those decisions and what risks are we looking through that window on. That's right. Um, so, before I even jump back to that, let's, let's, we're going to come back to that because you define it as five tectonic forces, yeah. which I'll get you to define. But yeah. let's do an economics 101 class. This is probably for me as a refresher because I think we need the fundamental basics here okay. uh, to do. So, sure. growing workforce plus productivity equals growth. That's right. Okay. Anything more to that? Any context that we should know more to that point? No. Uh, Self-explanatory. Uh, you know, think of it like if you had 1% labor force growth, 1% population growth in the economy. Yeah. That would mean you'd have 1% more workers every year. And that would put a floor under your growth rate economically, around 1%. And assuming you have some, you know, growth in productivity, yeah. you'd add that on. So say if you're lucky, 1% per year, then you'd have 2% economic growth. And then you'd have 2%, let's say, inflation. So what we, when you look out the window as a company, you'd see around 4% nominal headline growth in your business, unless you're gaining market share, which you have a higher number, or if you're losing, it'd be less. So that's a basic framework. And what I, you know, when I set out to do this, I thought, well, what kind of a framework can I lay out? And I realized none of the stuff that I thought was a constant is actually a constant. That's where, it, where the book came from, because I realized it couldn't really assert any of those things, you could hang your hat on them, because we're at a time when they're actually moving a lot. Yeah. And that means, if you're going to plan, you need to understand that better. Uh, not that you can just figure it out and plan exactly, but you need to plan with, the, with that variability in mind. Yeah. So what is the optimum growth? Optimum growth, well, you know, I mean, when you look at that, you want it to be as much as it can be, uh, and that means since, you, since population growth is kind of a given, I mean, you, we can adjust that by having more immigration or something, but let's just assume that away. You know, you're only producing new workers at a certain rate, and uh, so that puts the base under growth. And then productivity is something you'd like to have more and more of because that means there's more per person or you know, more to divide up, more tax revenues, more things you can do. Uh, and uh, so that comes from innovating or more efficiency at companies, and that kind of thing. Uh, so there's nothing optimal about it in, the sen in that sense, but it, it is kind of a speed limit, if you like. And if you were to try and somehow get more out of the system without generating more productivity or more workers, okay, government policy to try and boost growth, well, usually it wouldn't work. It would just cause inflation, right, because yeah. there'd be too much pressure to try and produce more. And that's a, a lesson that was learned the hard way in the 1970s. But, you know, we've learned it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then understand, so got the first two. The third one, the role of the central bank. Oh. Because I know there's going to be an issue, right? Once we yes. talk about government and the central bank and the relationship. Right. But what do you think the role is? So the role of the central bank is to, uh, is to provide a, the ideal environment in which companies can make optimal decisions without worrying about the context. So one element of the context might be, well, prices are going up 5 or 10% per year, well, and they don't go up altogether. They're, they're all, it's all uncertain. Well, that's a tough planning environment. But imagine if it was predictably around 2%, which is what we had for the past almost 30 years. Well, that takes an important piece of uncertainty off the table from a corporate point of view. And that's almost the most that a central bank can do. But as it turns out, by stabilizing inflation around that 
Uh, because of the way inflation happens, it happens through excess demand and excess supply, like that fluctuation in the economy, aiming for a constant inflation rate actually stabilizes the fluctuations in the economy. It makes them smaller. It means you have fewer ups and downs in unemployment and stuff, or at least smaller ones. Because it's actually, if you have a big one, that's going to throw inflation off target. So the central bank acts to make that deviation in the economy smaller. And that reduces how much inflation fluctuates later. So uh, well, what we've shown is that the past 30 years have not just been a more stable inflation environment. They've been, on average, throughout the world, a higher productivity environment. Companies have made better decisions in that low inflation environment. And there's been less variability in employment, few smaller business cycles. So all good. So that's central bank's role. It's kind of like just making sure the environment is... Well, there's one other I should mention, and that is the financial system needs to be safe and, you know, reliable. So uh, there's been, as you know, a couple of times when it wasn't. So, you know, this, I'm not just claiming that was perfect. Uh, but all that to say that central banks are meant to play a role in the background. For me, if you never heard from the central bank, that would have been just fine. You know, that would mean everything is going well, not in the news. Yeah. Okay. All right. We, got, we, we have the base layer here. So in your book, now we'll start to break it up, you talk about five forces. Right, five forces. That really, you know, we're all searching, every, you hear talk, <clears throat> when's normal coming back? When's normal coming right. back? Yeah. What's the new normal look like? And, and from what I've read in your book, the new normal is really uncertainty and volatility. <laughs> that's, that's the new normal. And, and you brought yeah. it down into five areas. An aging population, yeah. really, technology in terms right. of the progression, right. growing inequality, Rising debt, right. and the last one was climate change. Right. Okay, we're not going to touch on all. The aging population, I think we get. Really? Yeah, we, we understand the aging population. Did you know you get a year older every year? Yeah, we're, we're good on that. Okay. We don't like that part, okay. Stephen. Okay. <laughs> um, give us a context for the technology piece yeah. and the impact on the economy. And yeah. we're going to try and keep this tight. On We'll do that one, the inequality and maybe rising debt, and then I'll come to the, my big question. Okay, for perfect. So the, the importance of this is if you've got to think of the economy as always being hit by something. You know, it just always is. So think of the economy much like a bobblehead doll, you know, like it's always doing this. And if you leave it alone, it'll settle down. All right, then so to, using these forces is to identify where will it settle down. So when you say, when, what does normal look like? Where do we end up when this is over? And the answer is, well, somewhere different because the forces are actually in motion. So... You know, the demographic one's an obvious one because we are getting older. The whole world's getting older because 50 years ago we had the post-war baby boom and now we get the opposite. So we get the exit of uh, folks like me out of the workforce. Uh, so we, we've had 50 years of stability on the demographic front and we kind of think of it as normal. But what I'm arguing is not normal. We're going back to normal now after this 50-year thing. So that's a really important force to understand. But technology is by far the most important, so I'm glad you, you want to focus on that. So we know technology changes every day. Uh, there's always something new you're supposed to buy or something new you're supposed to use at work. Or, um, fine. Uh, but actually, in history, there's only been three major waves of what we call general purpose technologies. That's when they invent a new technology that gets used by everybody across the whole economy. Uh, and so that they are, of course, the first industrial revolution, or the one that we usually just call the industrial revolution, was the steam engine, right? So it replaced all those uh, folks, you know, that were doing hard labor, uh, you know, with, uh, with these, these machines. And at the time, everybody said, well, that's just a story for why I lost my job, right? So there's always this thing about technology displacing people. Uh, so that's the first one. The second one was electrification. You watch Downton Abbey, and it's all for the funny how, you know, well, now we got a refrigerator, you know, and lights and all this sort of stuff. It's really cool to watch that happening. But that's again hap affect productivity everywhere. And the third one is the computer chip, which went everywhere. And so what happens when you have a new technology like that is you get a wave of productivity. Okay. So there's only been three of these, and now we're just entering the fourth one. That's, the, that's the, the digitization of everything. So the AI, artificial intelligence, robotics, biotech, you know, those things that are all feeding on these big databases and stuff. 
And uh, so that, that's the next one, and, and it's only begun. It's been accelerated by the pandemic. You know, everybody bought, you know, overnight. You had, that's why we're short of chips. Overnight, everybody ordered truckloads worth of laptops and everything, and you bought exercise bikes. They've all got computer chips in them, right? So that's, that was amazing uh, demand for computer chips. Um, and we're still recovering uh, from that surge. Uh, the, the AI revolution, uh, arguably, we'd, we're just guessing, it could take 10 to 15 years, say. The, the, uh, the computer chip revolution uh, really started in around 1980, thereabouts, 78, 80. And you remember all through the 80s, people were talking about, uh, there should be productivity by now. And the quip that was said then was the productivity seems to be everywhere except in the statistics. And it took really until around 1995 when the productivity really started to show up in a macro way. So what happens is when there's more productivity, there's more capacity in the economy to produce. Uh, all kinds of things. And of course, people are losing their jobs because of the technology. You get the rising income inequality, which is part of the, right. part of the side effect. And, of course, other new jobs that you never heard of being created. And the price of everything starts going down because you're using the new technology, and if you don't lower your price, your competitor will, and they'll steal your lunch. Okay, So that deflation that comes from, from productivity is a very common feature. Well, in the first two industrial revolutions, that deflation happened without central banks either understanding or even having the ability to provide more money to finance all the new activity. And so what we had was a true deflation. We were under the gold standard, both of those. And we had the Victorian Depression, 23 years long, and the Great Depression in the 30s, which was only 10 years long, but it was only that short because World War II caused government spending to explode. You know. So the lessons from those, apply them to the mid-90s to, to the 2000s, well, uh, you know, that, remember the missing inflation? Well, that was what Greenspan was dealing with during his time. And uh, he kept interest rates low for far longer than anybody believed possible. People were screaming at him that he was taking inflation risk. And he said, no, 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 I don't see any inflation. So he did, did the right thing from a macro point of view, but also caused the global financial crisis. Okay, so a little side effect there that we can <laughs> yeah. kind of skip over. But... But you know, the, 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 in, the imbalances were building up and we didn't have the safeguards that we have today. So anyway, lesson learned. So we're heading into that now and I think that's, that's something we need to understand well from past industrial revolutions and understand how companies uh, can best deal with that. So that's, that's, I think, is the most important force and mainly also, it's a force for good. I mean, it's a positive force right. even though the dislocations are real. So what, what about, so you, you tied into the growing inequality piece through technology. So let's skip that one. But what about rising debt yeah. as, a, as a big force? Because yeah. um, what can you tell us about that? Well, so rising debt, we're all familiar with how households have accumulated all kinds of debt. Uh, every, every year it's a new record. And it's, you know, the chickens are going to come home to roost and all those kinds of statements. Um, but the fact is that, We've, we've innovated enough in our financial system that people can carry higher debt. Interest rates have tracked lower for the past 30 years, so the ability to service debt has improved throughout that period. Uh, so households, you know, I mean, of course, it's a vulnerability. Uh, if, you're, if you've got a lot of debt and you lose your job, well, then you'll see, you know, like they say, when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming without, without a bathing suit on. Uh, and, and so... <laughs> That, that, of course, is a risk, but fact is the system can carry more debt now. But the big one that people are more concerned about now is the government debt, which has ratcheted steadily higher, and, of course, during the pandemic has exploded higher. Yeah. Something like 20% of global GDP was borrowed in the last two years by governments, and we now are at a position where it's very similar to where we were after World War II in terms of government debt. So how we get from here to a more resilient you know, how we pay that back, you know, without just taxing future generations. You know, I'd, I'd feel guilty about that if that's how we did it, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So somehow or other, we need to get there. So when people say, well, same as after World War II, well, geez, during the 50s and 60s, 
I, I, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, my dad never said, you know, there's an awful lot of debt from the war. war. I never heard discussion of that at the kitchen table. But the economy was growing really fast, right? We had the baby boom. People were getting jobs. And, of course, the debt to, to GDP ratio was just collapsing. Governments never had to pay that money back. It just, it just kind of eroded as the economy got bigger. But now that won't happen because... We're not having a baby boom. We're having the opposite of a baby boom. Yeah. We're going to have slower economic growth. But the only good part of that is that we'll also have perpetually really low real rates of interest, too. So the ability to service debt is there. And as long as governments have a sustainable plan where debt is falling relative to the economy, just like a company, you know, no, no, no major company goes around with any, without any debt in their capital structure. Yeah. Nor should the government. You know, they shouldn't be worried if the government's using debt to finance long-term investments like infrastructure and that sort of thing, that's perfectly fine. You just don't want them to throw the money away. You know. So let's look at, in the context, and, and you and I talked about this a couple of months ago, so we, it's pre-COVID, Pre and you would you'd say, you'd say it's January 2020, the Canadian economy is in pretty good shape. You got buffers, you, yes. would, you would say. Yes. I got room to maneuver. Yes. Then we go... Post-COVID, right. that's when you and I sat in January 2022, actually. There was yeah. no war at the time. And you're like, all right, the buffers have kind of eliminated, but I'm still optimistic in terms of where we're going. We got inflation and stuff yeah. to where we are today. Yeah. Right? And we got a budget coming out tomorrow, too, which we can, we can come back to. Right? right? So I'm a business leader. Actually, we're all business leaders. We're looking out the window right now, right. Stephen. So what do I see? We got a war. So we got deglobalization going, right? We got rising inflation, which when we talked about it two months ago, we thought second half, not so bad anymore. Supply logistics would work its way out. Right. And it's not necessarily happening that way yep. for most of the businesses here today. Yep. Right. And we got commodity prices. So we got rising inflation. People, we're looking out the window here and we're thinking about our own talent. Wages are rising. People are quitting. They're not as motivated. At least we don't feel that way. Mm -hmm. And unemployment's really low. Uh, and there's tons of open jo job openings. So that's what I see out the window, too. Um, and we're in the fourth technology revol industrial revolution right now. Yeah. So all of us are looking through this window right now. Yeah. Where do we go? Like, <laughs> what actions? Because what you talk about is, in the book, is giving guidance, right? Seeing the risks. So we're seeing these risks, right? Yeah. Yeah. But how do we actually plan for anything? in terms of, especially for business leaders, right? You need to plan out for a year or two years or make decisions. Yes. Any advice? For, like, where do we go on that? And, and, and throw that in. Are we going now into a recession in the second quarter? Because that would be helpful in under, or in the, into the back end of this year or in yeah. 2023. Okay. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so I, I touched a lot there. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Like yeah. Well, yeah. Why don't we just move on to the next question? <laughs> uh, okay, so... Yeah, so we, of course, uh, you know, the, as you described it, the situation is incredibly complex. And uh, it would be nice to be able to say, well, you know, the bobblehead doll is like this, but here's what it's going to look like six months or a year from now. And, uh, and the, the truth, truthful answer is we don't know uh, that. Uh, that the, the uncertainty that we face is probably historic. Um, we've never had the... The, the, all these forces acting all at the same time and getting bigger at the same time. And so that means the underlying uh, equilibrium is, is vastly disturbed and not predictable. And what I'm arguing in the book is that actually many of the tools that economists use to try to make sense of all that also will not be able to cope with that. We, those, some of those things that are moving are things we assume are, are constants you know, in, in our models. Uh, making them all so they can move is just impossible to do in a model, the way economists do. So the way I see it is it's like this. You say, uh, economist says, well, I've analyzed all that. Look at all the stuff you've just mentioned, and look, it's okay. It's going to be 2% growth on average over the next four years. So go ahead and make your plan around that. And inflation it should come down you know, progressively, maybe not as fast as you and I talked about before because right. of the war, 
but it'll, it'll come down because it's just going to mathematically come down and the central banks are back are on the job so okay so it gives you that as, as forecast it says well, that's the best I can do there's a lot of uncertainty around it <laughs> that's the best I can do so that's very similar to asking economists can I walk across that river and he says yeah absolutely it's only 12 inches deep on average <laughs> Okay, turns out it's 60 feet deep in the middle. Okay, so one of my one of my advice is take swimming lessons because chances are you might have some 60 foot water in front of you, right? Yeah. Okay, it's a bit of a metaphor for that, and that is, you, it's not conceivable that you can create the perfect path and say, yeah, I, I figured it all out, and that's where it's going to be, because the the range of possibilities around that path will be enormous compared to in the past. Now, boards and management are often, they get this stage with their planning, and they're like, okay, well, let's, let's analyze some, some other scenarios. Like, what if this happens? Well, what if the war becomes a true world war? And, you know, okay, bad yeah. scenario, right? Yeah. So, they, you know, that kind of thing. So they do a really bad scenario, and that company's like, okay, well, what will we do? Well, we'd, we could serve cash, and we do this and that and the other thing. And, okay, if that happens, we know what we'd do. I don't know if we could survive it, but at least we know what we'd do. Well, what if things are really great? Oh, things are really great. We do this, that, and the other thing. Okay. So you got these two scenarios, and what happens to the board? The board goes, okay, I think the base scenario is about right. They fall in love with it because they've seen these extreme ideas, and they don't believe them. And the problem is that our normal concept of a bell curve with the most likely thing being that main scenario is gone. This is what actually Taleb argued in the, the Black Swan, his book. So the distribution of possibilities is much wider, and we need to be prepared for more extremes. And that means saying, I don't know what's going to happen, but I've got a buffer so that I can defend myself if I'm wrong on that side. Right. But I also, if I'm wrong on the other side, I got that buffer too. That allows me to capitalize on good news. And we know that good luck outweighs bad luck on average. Okay, so it's really important to remember a lot of companies prepare themselves for downside risk, but don't really think about, well, what if something good happens and they're not really ready to pounce on it or are willing? So all that to say, it's about risk management. And it's not about making it up in the boardroom. It's about dedicating actual resources, you know, having a team, a risk management team, uh, that's always looking for new opportunities or re-optimizing the plan as the data unfold so that you're more nimble. I think that's kind of the where we're headed for. I think companies that look at a really risky situation, most of them are going to be like, um, well, the return on that investment that you're offering me is looks okay, except it's if I adjust it for risk, it's too low. So I'm just not going to do it. It's not worth it. I think that's where the mistakes will be made, that people should think of high-risk opportunities as an opportunity to manage the risk down to enhance the return, to convert the risk to returns for the shareholder. And we don't really think of risk that way these days. Okay? And if we let those opportunities go by, somebody who thinks longer term is going to snap them up. Makes sense. What do you oh, do with the hope so? <laughs> what, what about the government though? Oh. Uh, and what do you tell the government about that in terms of the buffer and, and how they look at it? Yeah, so the government's the same. I mean, look, we we uh, here in Canada, we were you mentioned before, the economy was in great shape just before this happened. I mean we think of, I always call it home. You know, home is at the intersection of 2% inflation and full employment. Where else would you rather be, right? And, and try, to, try to move neighborhoods and just mess it up, okay? So that's, it's a neighborhood, though. It's not an exact address. But we were there before this happened. So there's no better place to be when something big is coming your way that it requires you to, uh, to react. Uh, so, like a healthy individual can shake off COVID the way a healthy economy can shake off COVID. And from the beginning, I had a lot of faith in the resilience for that reason. The Canadian economy, at the time, they said, oh, there's Sonny Steve again. You know, and the headlines were, oh, this will be the worst recession since the Great Depression and all that kind of stuff. And none of that happened, right? None of it happened. Well, that's really good news. And we shouldn't lose sight of that, you know. So we, now, we are now in a stage where, of course, we're not home, but we're heading back home again. And uh, 
the government was in such a well-placed place because of past successes, fiscal consolidation. The debt-to-income ratio in Canada federally was about 30 percent. So I'll just remind you that in 1994, when we had a little, uh, not quite a crisis, but a lot of tension in the international markets, uh, the Canada's debt-to-income ratio was way, way over 60%. It was more than double that. And the debt-service ratio was eating up all kinds of money every, every day. So uh, that's when we were called the Northern Peso. The Canadian dollar was called the Northern Peso by the Wall Street Journal. Well, we've come a long way since then. We have lots of leaders that we should give credit for, for getting there. So we're well placed for this. And so when this happened and they put the programs in place, that people said, well, how much is that going to cost? Serb. Well, it costs what it costs. We're putting it there. And the number of people who are unemployed and apply for Serb, they'll get the money. When they get their job back, they won't get the money. We don't know how much it'll cost. But we're allowing for at least this much in our budget. So people say, there's the government spending all that money. Well, no, they were just making it available. So at the time, people thought we were going to go back more or less to where we were back in the mid-90s, like 60-something percent of GDP as a, as a debt ratio. As it turned out, because the economy was much more resilient, we used far less of that capacity than expected. That's been a persistent pattern in all the budgets since the pandemic, and we'll see it again tomorrow. Okay, the economy has outperformed expectations, and the government has borrowed far less than they provisioned for. The question is, what do they do with the capacity? That's the question. But it means that the debt ratio, I don't really know what it'll be in the budget, of course, but I can, you know, I can guess that it's going to be like under 50, you know, like it's going to be 40-something. Be nice to get back down to the 30-ish or 30-something, you know, so that we're more prepared for the next whatever happens. So that's what I mean by rebuilding your buffers, so that we're we're able to respond just as we just did to whatever happens next. Because uh, if it happened again tomorrow, we're not actually prepared. There's other ways in which we're not prepared, right? We know, like the medical system was not prepared. There is no excess capacity at all. So as soon as something like this happens, well, all the surgeries get canceled like for a long time. So there are a lot of downside costs there to, to ordinary people, um, and that's regrettable. So that's another place where we need more buffers to be built. This will cost money, but and companies need buffers. Households need buffers. They've got a lot of savings from the pandemic because they couldn't spend a lot of their money. I think they're going to keep a bunch of it. So. So if I, I'm just going to come back to the corporate world for one sec, because what you described about risk management, I understand, but you're talking about it from a very large perspective, right? Those that have those boards in place, yeah. corporate Canada, right. the majority of businesses in Canada are small, mid-sized businesses, That's right? Correct. They're not setting up risk management teams to do this. Yes. You know, you, again, you're looking out the window, you see all this stuff today. What does the SME do? Like, if you're in their position today, are you building your cash? reserves here? Yes. So the uh, so the, the SME needs to think in exactly the same way. I mean, I know they can't have a, a big staff of risk management people or anything like this, but they need to have uh, reserves. They can't spend all their capital on their plan and then be caught naked when the tide goes out. Okay? And they have to assume the tide's going to go out a lot more often and maybe bigger than in the past. So they need to be more prepared. Uh, their financial intermediaries may be in a position to help. Their audit firm may be in a position to help analyze some of the risks that they face. So that's a, a good resource. You're paying the audit firm anyway. Um, you know, a, a little extra uh, money to them can go a long ways because they're exposed to such a wide range of companies and can give you that kind of uh, insight into what, uh, what might be faced and how would you deal with it. But I, I don't see an alternative to preparing yourself for more volatility um, and uh, and knowing what you would do, and but it, but bear in mind, uh, there's just as much good luck out there as bad luck. That's a really important thing to remember from history. And in fact, good luck has vastly outweighed bad luck. Okay, so so being ready doesn't just mean having a bunch of cash so you can just throw it out the door, you know, to keep the company going. It means being ready to pounce. Opportunistic. Yeah, being opportunistic. So you need a chief risk officer, but you also need a chief opportunities officer. Yeah. Kind of like that idea. And um, and if there's uh, other ways of 
you know, there, there are ways for, for small companies to manage some of the other risks that they'll be presented with, like HR risks or, you know, things related to HR. Uh, you know, there are insurance companies around, you know, you can, you can work with in order to cover some of those risks. Some might say, well, that's kind of an expense. I say, yeah, but that's, you know, it's like when you insure your car, that's an expense. But when it comes for renewal time, do you go, oh, shoot, I shouldn't have insured my car because I didn't have a claim. No, right? So I think you mentioned deglobalization. It's another example. Like, people are worried about their supply chains now like they weren't before. Well, that's good. So what will they do? Well, they won't necessarily just bring everything domestically. They'll look for ways to reduce the risk in their supply chain. Having more than one company be their supplier, different countries, that'll cost a little bit more money, but it's just money well spent in an insurance sense. So I think we'll see a lot of that. There, there are many different ways uh, of managing risks. I can only talk to you about the broad uh, kinds of issues. Every company is going to be different. So it's interesting because I, I look at the ultra high net worth today, and if I look at their asset allocation, their buffer today yep. is they're holding about 11 to 12 percent of cash. Opportunistic, yep. right? So yep. they sit on their cash. Understood. If you're a betting man today and you're running a, an SME, what percentage of cash, like what type of debt, equity, or what type of cash would you be holding today? Well, I don't know. I mean, 10 percent 10, 10 or more sounds like a lot, doesn't it? In an asset it allocation a sense, uh, but in, but in a in in the in the real life of a company, a company, the small companies almost always start start for cash. Uh, so uh, there there may be other ways. For example, you know you've got a a, a deep pocketed investor that's there and says, you know, look, I think you know, don't worry, we we've, we've got if you need five percent injection, I'm still here because I believe in this long term play. Uh, that's one form that could take. But I just think in general, it's going to vary from company to company. What are you actually exposed to? Uh, I really can't give you a number right. like that. But, okay. but that's, that's the kind of behavior that we're talking about. Yeah. At PEO Leadership, I'm surrounded by other business leaders who challenge me to become better. Les Mandelbaum, founder and CEO of Umbra. Leaders really need to step outside their world and get new perspectives. PEO Leadership is more than peer-to-peer -peer advisory. It's a community of top executives with global experience. Our retail landscape is rapidly changing. PEO Leadership has been vital in helping us navigate through this. The time to step up and lead is now. Go to peo-leadership.com. Okay, well, why don't we open it up to uh, the audience, and maybe I'll kick it off with Greg over at Focus with the Just first like question. That. Just yeah. like that. Just like that. Just pick much. somebody. Maybe a bit off, uh, maybe a bit off the, the fairway, I guess, the way I play golf uh, question. <laughs> but you talked about uh, accumulated government debt, and one of the tools, your, your world is more around interest rates and, and controlling um, the central bank rate. We don't hear much about immigration policy in terms of stimulating economic growth, you know, above that 1% that would come from immigration growth, which I think is about 1% right now. Yep, yep. And, you know, you just don't hear about it much, yet we hear all this about interest rates and, and government spending. And Does this just happen by accident, or who, who really is on the ball in terms of what are we doing <laughs> deliberately there, and, and why don't we okay. hear about it a whole lot, and yeah. could, we, could we actually grow to 2% growth in our population annually to hit a target on reducing our debt to GDP? Just, you never hear about it. I'm curious on your thoughts. A uh, couple of good questions in there. Um, so, well, let me start with the last part first, which is that the government uh, was, has been pretty clear about what they call its, their fiscal guardrails. That, for them, the single measure of that is the debt, government debt to, to GDP ratio that I mentioned, you know, could have been as high as 60% when the crisis first happened. Uh, I think it was planned to be in the mid-50s on the first, the fall update that year. I forget exactly those numbers, but as I said, we've done probably, you know, five, six, seven percentage points better than this. And that's a big saving compared to what it could have been like. Uh, so, so those guardrails are there, and that'll be that'll be a centerpiece again in the tables tomorrow. Like, what's the forecast for that ratio? And uh, and I know the the government is committed to being clear about that, and uh, you know, hopefully having it come down through time. As I said, build the, rebuild the buffers. 
So we'll see uh, tomorrow. Now, uh, but, but, get, but getting back to uh, the demographic side, it actually has been a centerpiece. Uh, this government recognized, actually both the previous government did too. And so we had increases in population, uh, immigration allowances under the Harper government, and then again under the Trudeau government, and then yet again under the Trudeau government. So like they're, they're basically 400 and I can get the number around 440,000 is the target, I think, for this year. So that's a good, you know, 50, 60, 70,000 more than say 10 years ago. Um, and, uh, and, and I think it's kind of uh, judged by how, the, how much can the system handle? I was just at a conference uh, that the Globe Mail put on this afternoon on the role of immigration in innovation and productivity. Um, and, you know, there are some basic facts here that we know, like immigration is not just people that, that do work and gives us that 1% you talk about. Uh, immigrants, uh, on average, create more businesses than, than the rest of us. Uh, uh, they they come from usually a situation which is less than ideal, so they're like, wow, new opportunity. They're hardworking, you know, and all this. So so they're highly productive, um, and so they are part of that productivity generating uh, uh, scheme. And so uh, we should be facilitating as much as we can, or as much as we think the system can handle. Now, one participant of that conference said that he estimates there's 1.8 million people waiting in line to immigrate to Canada. That, in fact, uh, we're, what, we're, what we're bad at is the execution. You know, actually getting the paperwork done, getting them approved, getting them in. And I think that's probably true. Uh, so we, it's, we, we put out numbers, but we don't necessarily give the resources to the department that's in charge of approving everybody. They, they did expand that budget for them a bit, but I think it sounds like they need to do some more there. Uh, I'm not an expert on it, but I, I get that impression. But I'll tell you, just this week they announced they were expanding the temporary foreign worker program. Even when I was governor at the bank, we used that a lot. To get a PhD in economics, it, there, aren't that, there aren't that many in Canada. We are the biggest employer of PhDs in economics. And the ones you do find want to go be professors and stuff, so you're always trying to compete to get them. And uh, lots of really high quality students in our universities from afar. Well, you get them in under the temporary foreign worker program, they get a couple of years, they love it here. You know, then they're in the, the queue, the, the 1.8 million queue. So it's again about execution. That's our most important channel of immigration, actually, and so it's the wrong time to be nickel and diming our universities, right? To think that's the most important attraction channel for people. So anyway, it, it is a live issue. I think you'll hear stuff about it tomorrow. I mean, they'll at least remind us how much they've increased the, you know, the, the targets. And uh, if we're lucky, they'll give more resources to those who are trying to deal with that high flow. And of course, right now, we're, we're welcoming an extra bunch of folks from Ukraine, uh, which is great. I mean, my, my grandfather came from Ukraine in, the, in between the two wars. And you know, I talked to a construction company this week, and they said, well, we'll hire, we, we're short of workers. We, as long as they got a little bit of exposure trades, we're, we'll train them. Uh, that's the kind of attitude you like. My grandfather worked, he was a shoemaker, but it, and he was from East, from, sorry, Western Ukraine. And, uh, but he worked in the mines in Sudbury for, I guess, three years or so, and then made the big move down to Oshawa to open up his own shoe repair shop. You know, that's uh, entrepreneurial. There you go. So. Good story. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Next question. Uh, we'll go right to the back. Or, or we'll go over there and then to the back. It's always a race Dave. for the person with the mic. <laughs> Sorry, Joanne. <laughs> Joanne. <laughs> I was finding it interesting how, um, you know, we got the macro environment where you're kind of dwell and live in. And then as a business owner and multiple business owner, I find that whatever I hear from you is not exactly aligning with what the reality is for me. And there's the gap is getting bigger instead of smaller. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Much more so. Well, it's here. And, and I find it so frustrating because it's like, okay. you know, uh, you know, Inflation, you're talking maybe five, whatever percent. 
Well, my reality in my own business is 20, 30%. Is it? And how do you recover that money? Yeah. Then you say, okay, well, your margins, you can go and get this insurance and you can do this and you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. All of these strategies that you spoke of. But if you're not bringing in the same amount of money as you used to, I'd like to know, I don't have an angel investor. I'm my own angel investor right now. I understand. Okay. Yeah. So I'm limited with opportunities and then canadian banks on the overall are so risk adverse for canadian business that it's it's just a joke so i'd like to know how you guys can kind of get your narrative and be so different to where i think it is okay well you mentioned a lot of things there and and this is why when i was governor and before that when i was with edc spent as much time as i could actually talking to companies Okay, every town I was in to give a speech, they're always at either breakfast or lunch or dinner with, you know, a dozen or... Well, there you go. <laughs> well, there you go. That's, that's what I'm talking about. So, uh, so, I mean, of course I don't have that quick answer for, for your specific situation. Um, and I know, like right now, the, the, the gap between reality and what is actually going on seems big. You mentioned inflation in particular, okay? So, so let's spend a minute on that, okay? Because that's, I'm sure everybody is wondering about inflation. I'm sure they should be. So uh, I know when you, when you see the price, let's say the price of oil doubles. Well, I mean, I mean of course, that's, that's inflation, right? But, but no, that's, of, seriously, if the price, if price yeah. of something doubles, that's inflation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, of course it is. But actually it isn't, not in an economist sense. It just means the price went up, okay? That's, I, I'm, I'm going to be totally blunt with you. It just means the price went up. Do you really think it's going to go up another $100 next year and another $100 a year after that? It's literally impossible because the economy would cave in and, and oil would be $10, okay? So we know that oil prices are never a source of actual inflation. Inflation is something that goes on, you know, forever. That's, you know, so you got to change your whole business model and you got to pay people an extra 5% per year or something to cope with it. So that's what we're trying to avoid, is that kind of inflation. The fact that prices go up, what economists say exogenously or you know, literally by themselves, there's nothing you can do about that. Now let's say you wanted to do something about it. We have a 2% inflation target and the price of oil doubles, so inflation goes up to 5% because of that. Well, two things are, are important here. First is, if I was religious about keeping inflation at 2%, I would raise interest rates really fast and crush the rest of the economy so there was deflation in your company and every other company in the room except for Suncor, right? And so those prices would go down enough to offset the higher oil price. Well, that's just nonsense. No one one would ever advocate doing that. So all that's really going on right now is an attempt to try to keep you to still believe that inflation can be around two or a little above percent when this is all over. And if you can, if you can believe that, expectations stay solid, then we don't have to change the whole world in order to get there. And so well, what are the ingredients there? The fact is that if the price of oil doubles, it takes for 12 months, the inflation rate looks like it's five or six percent. But when the 12 months are done, the tail end of that 12-month calculation has popped up to, to a doubling, and inflation looks flat again. Unless, okay, you're with me? Because the price goes up from 100 to, for 50 to 100. So it looks like 50, 100% inflation until the base of the calculation becomes 100. Then it's 100 compared to 100. Now it's zero. So oil stops being a source of inflation after 12 months. That's a lot of that going on right now. So, example, hotel rooms. Before the pandemic, just the day before the shutdown, I was here in Toronto, women's capital mar- women in capital markets at the Royal York, and it was $449 for the hotel room. Okay, I stayed there last night. It's $300. Is that inflation? Well, it's twice what it was 12 months ago. So the price of a hotel room has doubled over the last year, and that's in your inflation comic, right? But it's still below what it was before the pandemic. So it's kind of like deflation and inflation all at the same time. It's understandable that it's confusing. So there's a lot of that in the numbers. And what I'm telling you is that over the next 
six, 12 months, that's just going to keep drifting down as the base keeps coming up. What's underneath that, though, is there's excess demand in the economy, so you could be seeing the real deal. And that's the part that the Bank of Canada will be very interested to try to prevent. Same thing with the Fed. Jay Powell says, well, if there's 10 million ex excess demand in jobs, 10 million positions open, I got to raise rates enough so that it, 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 that gets down closer to equal. And then you'll have taken the excess demand out of the economy, but the economy's still fine. Okay? So we don't have to have a, a bad cycle, a big recession, not necessarily. It still could happen. But you have to try to, I know it's not easy, but you have to try to see through all that. And somehow you're juggling what your employees are demanding, and I get it. It's not easy. That's, and, I'm, and all I'm saying in the book is, if you think that's hard, five years from now, it's going to feel a lot harder. So find ways to prepare yourself for less predictability in what you do, and, uh, and everybody will have their own way of doing that. And it might be harder to make money. Well, that's the challenge, I think. Yeah. I, I know David's business, but it, it resembles a lot of business here. You have oil prices that go up, and, well, that's part of your cost of goods, right? So yes. there's 12 months. Well, it's been 18 months of essentially being squeezed on margin, I right? Yeah. So if you didn't have any buffers as a company, whether it be cash or anything, yeah. it is very, very difficult right, right now. So that's why we're sitting there and you say, okay, what's inflation next year? Will, oil can, will it go up even 25% next year, right? How do I plan for that? Because right. my margins are going to continue to be squeezed to the point where we don't have a business anymore. Understood. Uh, you know, I, I understand it perfectly. But I don't have an answer for it. Uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, so, so you have to figure out, you know, do a, do a scenario and say, well, let's just assume it stays on $100 forever, for example. How would I manage my company? Okay, now well, I've done that. I think I can manage but I have to do this and that and the other thing to manage it. And now, just to be safe, let's try 150, just, you know. And, of course, at a certain point, you think, well, I couldn't survive it. Okay, well, that's, that's your last contingency plan. But understanding what that looks like is what I'm talking about. It's not like pretending it can't happen because that's... We're in a place where we have to. Yeah. It's not that we get a choice. It's, it's like yeah. it's, it's, you want to survive year yeah. in under these kind of situations. And like you said, we'll we'll put a higher range. Where are we going to be at if that happens at this level? That's right. And where are we going to be at if it gets better? Yeah. You know? So we're we're actually considering all those things. Okay. And so I mean that's just the nature of being a business owner, an entrepreneur. Yeah. I guess the difference though, David, is also, you know, pricing, right? So you gotta maintain the market. So yeah. Being reactive versus proactive, right? Yeah, I understand. So a lot of businesses were very reactive over the last 12 months around pricing increases. Yes. Right? Now yeah. they're thinking, for future, I don't want to go through being reactive again. So let's think about the next 12 months and the risk right. there. Should I already be thinking about price increases over the, in the next six months? Here? Right. So, so if there's a permanent rise in your cost and you adjust your pricing in order to account for that, and let's say just keep your margin like it was, small as it might have been, right? You just... So, and you talk to your customer and say, I'm not, I'm not talking about creating some price spiral with you here. I'm just trying to, you know, share the, the risk about these oil prices. That's a really important part of my business. And the customer's like, yeah, me too. Whatever. So you work that out. Uh, that's one thing. But, but what, what we're concerned about is that it becomes a spiral, you know. And if it becomes a spiral, then the whole game changes big time. And that, then we really are back to the, to the 70s. So that's, a, that's what we call a supply chain issue. You know, if, 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 if you're coming down the DVP to get here today and somebody has a flat tire or whatever, it takes you an hour and a half to get here instead of the usual 30 minutes. Well, it's, it's, this is what happened to the global system. Okay, so there's bunching up problems and people pay a price. But you have to ask yourself, are supply chain issues likely to get twice as bad next year? It's literally impossible because there are people in the business of moving that stuff that are making a fortune, okay? And so they'll invest around that, and they're going to like, okay, now we're through the traffic jam, and it's going to cost this much. So, so again, it's, it can't actually be a spiral. Otherwise, everything just stops, all right? And then there's excess supply and no demand, and the economy falls off a cliff, and 
You know, that's not a scenario that's very likely. So it's usually not a source of inflation. What happens is you, but, but look, I, I, what I want, there's something else I want to say, which is that the situation that we're headed for is one in which I believe um, a lot of the power that exists to the extent that you have it now is going to shift from the employer to the employee. So vast shortages of workers, especially the skilled ones, the, the technological revolution okay. will make it more acute in, this, in, the, in the skilled space. And, and so you're going to be faced with, like, if you've got a profit margin, you're going to give some of it away. I think that's, that's kind of what's, and actually, in an aggregate sense, uh, the share of, of total income in the world going to labor has never, ever in the history of, of economics been as low as it is today. So uh, it's the sort of stuff that in other industrial revolutions has literally led to revolutions, okay? And so and when you see, uh, you know, Amazon losing a vote or Walmart anticipating a vote and giving people a higher uh, reservation wage, those kinds of things, you're seeing companies trying to prevent unionization and, and that while well, they're giving away profit margin in order to do that. That, I think, is going to be a trend, not a, just a one-time thing. And the income inequality will just get worse over the next five to ten years, and so the pressure for that will just keep growing. That's part of your reality. I don't have the answer for you. Good. Next question. Hi, thanks so much for your, uh, your remarks tonight. Um, I know we're, we're going to hear the budget tomorrow, and yeah. I feel like when I'm reading, whether you know, I read the Globe or the Post, you're kind of whipsawed by how to think about this kind of expansion of government spending. You know, on the one hand, it's you know we need universal um, daycare and childcare. There's you know debt has never been cheaper. On the other hand, it's you know we've abandoned the fiscal guardrails. You know the era of big government. You know no one is talking that this is an issue. H how should we think about it? You know have the world like modern monetary policy have, has how we should think about debt fundamentally change. Or should we be concerned within the massive expansion of government spending now that the pandemic is waning? Yeah. Well, I, I just as a general, a general proposition, let's just all agree that pretty well everything you read is going to be exaggerated. Okay. So uh, that's just the way it is. Okay. So I think pay attention to the numbers tomorrow. As I indicated, I think. There, there, there's been a lot of good news in the economy, so it should be reflected in the fiscal framework, and the guardrails should look respectable. But what, what I don't know, no one really knows till tomorrow, will this fiscal dividend all be spent on new initiatives, or will some of it be put in the bank to rebuild our resilience? That's, a, that's a, for me, a key question for tomorrow. We know that there's pressures to do some new things, like, oh, not child care. We get that finally signed up, right? So that's in the baseline now. And by the way, I was an avid supporter of that because we proved in Quebec that it increases the capacity of the economy. It brings more women into the workforce. It did an amazing job over the past 20 years. And if we replicate that in uh, for the rest of Canada, we're talking about maybe a percentage point of productivity growth, if you like, forever. Right? You think about taking a $2 trillion economy and adding 1% to it every year forever just by investing in a social gap, a social infrastructure gap such as childcare. So I think that thing will pay for itself. I have no issues with that at all. And give me some more of that. You know, If you're going to invest in infrastructure, that's going to pay for itself. Uh, whether it's digital or physical or other social. Now, uh, there's going to be pressure on defense. We know there's going to be a big bump in the defense line. Any Canadians going to vote against that? You know, maybe, but I, I, I kind of think people are like, wow, look what's going on. We're, we're caught flat-footed here, so, you know, we're not prepared. So, it's again, we're not resilient on that front, so let's, let's get that up. Um, and... Uh, new thing dental I guess I don't really know what that might look like so there are things that that need to be fit in there somehow politically how does it end up looking well we'll see tomorrow 
But provided that the guardrail is still there front and center and it's demonstrating a downtrend, I will say, well, at least they've satisfied what I call the sustainability minimum. That as long as it's declining, what that means is that we are able to service our debt just ordinarily and that the indebtedness is falling through time all by itself. So it is kind of a minimum sustainability criterion. You might wish it goes faster. And that would represent if they take some of the dividend and actually put it in the bank to make it go down faster. Kind of a, you know, we'll have to just see. But, but anyway, that's, that's, I think, the things to watch for tomorrow. Uh, do they, they'll have room to maneuver. They'll have choices to make. And I don't really know what choices they will make and therefore how much it will add up to. Uh, but... Uh, but I'm pretty confident that they, 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 will, they, they still believe in and will respect those guardrails that they've set, set out. Good. Thank you, Stephen. Eric. Hi. Um, so I, I know you touched on the innovation technology. We're just about to start another, revolu like the next evolution of that. And um, definitely over the past couple of years that I'm in the tech space, you know, Amazon, Microsoft are talking about AI, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, uh, everything to do with that. So productivity is going to go through the roof. Um, output and production is going to go through it. Autonomous, you know, checkouts, everything in the yes. sense of, uh, I've even seen now going to McDonald's is going to be like completely autonomous. You won't even need a teller anymore. They've got a new Alexa version of ordering your, uh, you know, drive through now. So with that happening, and then at the same time, we have an aging population, the crosshairs is going to be, the production capability is going to be 3 to 5x, but yet the demand potentially is going to be half ah. over the next five years or seven years as people are also exiting the workforce and they're not having the same demands on the economy. And you can immigrate to offset the amount of people that we're talking about here from what I've seen numbers-wise across North America. Okay, so you're, you're suggesting that this juxtaposition gives us a deficient demand kind of scenario. There's just, so, you know, uh, to an extent that happens in every industrial revolution. So when it first happens, we have this old parable. This was, uh, there's a, an economist called Arnold Harberger. And uh, he's a really important economist because he developed what we call the Harberger Triangle. You know, so that's a tool that economists use. Never mind that. The point is, he gave this speech once, and he says, "You know, when there's when there's technological progress, as economists, what we imagine is that the productivity goes out there and like yeast, and everybody gets some. Like it just fills all the cracks, and everybody gets some, and that's what we have in our models. Productivity goes up, everybody feels it, everybody's feeling good. They have more money to spend, right? That's what productivity would be like." And he says, "But the thing is, in the real world." It's actually more like mushrooms. Productivity pops up here and there, and of course, who gets it? Amazon or Google or somebody. Like the big, the big companies pluck the mushrooms. And uh, that's why income inequality goes up so much during these industrial revolutions, because you get left out, lose your job, you know, people protest against new technology. They, they decide they're going to have a union again, prevent prevent Alexa from taking the orders at McDonald's or whatever they all do. So this is what happens in every industrial revolution. Those tensions come up and political polarization erupts, right? Because especially now with, with social media fueling it all, it means that politicians are no, no, you know, they, their job was hard enough before, but now it's impossible like, to reconcile all these loud voices. So I'm adding it up to be quite a mess. But what happens in the next stage, which is only... Not long. This is like a continuous process, what you're describing. So, you know, these, uh, the tech workers, you know, like the, the, the amazing job growth, right, in this sector. What are they doing with all that money? Are they spending it on iPads or no? They're spending it on clothes and houses and furniture, cars, ordinary stuff. Renovating their new house, you name it. Okay? That's where it gets spent. So what happens is they're creating jobs across the entire economy. And you don't, if you lose your job at McDonald's because Alexa is doing the ordering now, 
And you think, oh, now I have to learn how to write code in order to get a job? No, you just have to learn how to hang drywall or, you know, or if you're a driverless truck comes along and you lose your job as a truck driver, well, do you have to learn how to write code in order to get back in the workforce? No, you, you can pick up some uh, trades type skill. You can be an electrician's apprentice or, or do furnace maintenance. I mean, you know, it's not, there's a lot more furnaces because of what I've described. So the point is that this is the part that nobody ever talks about. They talk about the displacement of workers and all these. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. It's been true every time. But through history, I mean, if you thought about it, back in 1867, 50% of Canadians were working in farms. Well, how did we get from there to here? <laughs> I mean, they aren't still out there looking for jobs on farms. Okay, we got here because of the general improvement in living standards that came from the technology. And all, uh, okay, China, much more recent example. Land reform, big farms instead of little farms. People are like, no, I lost my job, I lost my farm, so my call's halted, I'm moving to the city, now I'm going to make iPads, you know, and uh, make them really cheap because this is huge for me. I'm getting, making a great living now. And for us, it was very inexpensive labor. But... So that's, that's the continuous process that we're going to go through. And it, it's always there to a degree, but it's only had these major waves three times. And this is going to be a really big one. Think about the one for the computer chip. In the book, I estimate that this, this gave us about 10 percentage points of GDP out of thin air. Now that's a big number to then re to receive every year from then on. And that money gets spread everywhere and creates livelihoods in all kinds of sectors. Um, I know that sounds like a little bit of hocus pocus. That's that's the way economists are always, you know. No, but, but I read about that in your book. You talked it, about the K, right? It's yeah, the time. It just it, takes time it for takes the second time, track to jump to the top. And we need track. to be ready to buffer those folks as they go through it, uh, help them make those transitions. Uh, if necessary, give them a guaranteed basic income, you know, the universal basic income or something. Or CERB-like kind of thing. Uh, so help them tap into training if that's what they need and so on. Help them move if they have to move. Uh, we don't do a lot of those things. We have programs, but they're kind of like, you know, they're there. you got to take all the risk yourself. I think society owes it to these folks, you know, to do a better job than we did through globalization. I mean, we got this whole generation that kind of feels like, well, I got left out of that. You know, is there what Harper in his book calls, you know, the somewheres versus the anywheres. The mobile professional can be anywhere, but the person where the mill closed is still living in that town and no work for them. So they need to be able to move, and some of the risk can be borne by society because when they match with a new job, then we all benefit, right? So anyway, I'm talking kind of abstractly to you, but... I think it's, and it's hard for, for people to be convinced that let's, let's do it the opposite, right? Let's, let's deglobalize and, or let's, let's prevent technology from doing what it can do in order to preserve jobs, right? People find it hard to believe that that means there's fewer jobs for people to renovate your kitchen. But that's exactly what happens. They don't see a connection between those things. Well, there's just less income. So one of the things that doesn't happen is you don't renovate your kitchen. And there's fewer jobs for the people that, you know, destroy your kitchen and then rebuild your kitchen, right? So it's, these are not jobs that you have to go to university for years and years in order to uh, train up for. And we can make those transitions as a society. We will. We have in the past. But not as quickly as we should be able to. Yeah. Okay. And the central bank plays an important role. Let me just finish yeah. with this. Because providing a, a relaxed monetary policy at a time when that's happening was what, exactly what Greenspan did intuitively. And as I said, one of the byproducts was the buildup in pressures, and that was an unfortunate side effect. But you'd still say as a macro thing, it was the right thing, like to accommodate it so you didn't get deflation. People, you know, the economy grew fast, and we were able to fill in all those jobs. Remember, unemployment was a record low. That's what should happen this time, except we've got more safeguards to protect us from financial excesses than we had back in the mid-90s. One last question, then I'll go over to James. 
wrap okay. this up. Oh, okay, I didn't realize you, we're are you out okay of with that? Well, 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 I'm fine. I'm here. I'm here. I don't, I, we're going to start drinking if wine. You're, if you're going to we're gonna start drinking wine, then that's a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> First off, thank you, Stephen, for your insights. You've got my mind racing, and I'm sure a lot of us in here uh, with uh, the opportunities and the possibilities of the future and things. Uh, a question for you, and this is a little global, uh, because the impact that the global world has on Canada can be pretty significant as yeah. well. And Ray Dalio Ray wrote something lately, uh, lately called the uh, New World Order. I don't know if you're yeah. familiar with that work. You know, when you look up my book, it says, on, on Amazon, it says, often purchased with... <laughs> Ray Dalio's, Ray Dalio's book. Love it. Like, I, and I, like, I know, I know Ray, and I think that's, and I'm an admirer of Ray. And I yeah. have his book, but I, of course, I didn't buy my own book on on Amazon. But, yeah. but, but I thought, you know, you know, I look to see how, you know, get some of the reviews from people, which is kind of cool. You have to click yeah. on it to see what the reviews say, and it says often purchased with. Ray Dalio's book. <laughs> well, I, hey, it, that's pretty cool. That's it, pretty, and I, yeah. I could see why. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> two brilliant pieces of work, by the way. But, well, thanks. Uh, yeah. you, you know, in, in the New World Order, it, you know, he goes back and it's the Dutch and then the British and then yeah. the Americans and, and it ties the financial to the social parts Indeed, of how yeah. they all rose yeah. and everything. And, right. and, and, and the one key element that really kind of hit me was that so often the change was driven by internal division, right? Yes. And what we're seeing stateside more than anywhere else in the world right now is a significant amount of that. Yes. And, you know, are we, is there going to be, what's the impact going to be globally? Do you think we're going to have a change there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, from a U.S. perspective? And are we looking at significant changes in Canada, right? Because, right. you know, a lot of people re don't realize that you know, the total population of Canada is actually less than the state of California. Yes. But we've got a global imprint and personality that is huge, you know, globally. Yeah. And yeah. How, how do you think that's going to play itself out? Yeah, so you're onto something that, uh, in fact, in Canada, it matters a lot more in the sense because we, we're exposed to the international side. We can't be who we are without that exposure, right? And so whereas the U.S. could be, the U.S. could shut itself off from the world. I mean, of course, there'd be downsides. Deglobalization in Trump style, you know, would be, would reduce the standard of living significantly in the United States. But at least they'd have still a big self-contained market. And hopefully we could still tap into it and we'd all manage. But we wouldn't manage as well as we do. And we were particularly exposed. Getting to your politi it's really a political question that you're asking, and um, and and you know Ray has, has has touched on this thing. So, and what I what I do in here is I talk mainly the to me the the both globalization and technological progress has caused this K shaped you know, the K shaped trajectory for the economy. So the the folks who lose out end up in the bottom part and of the K, and the top part of the K just accelerates. That's you know the tech tech space, but it's all the peripheral. Like during the pandemic, we've had tremendous growth in the top part of the K, which is one of the reasons why we have shortage of workers, because folks in the bottom part of the K, you know, maybe students that were waiting on tables, they've graduated, they're now they're lawyers, they're chartered accountants, they're engineers, whatever they are. So so we've had that and we need the immigration side to pick up speed so we have people for that for that lower part of the K, because it still exists. It just won't grow fast. Right, but it still needs people. Um, the the uh, uh, what I what I think is going to happen is that that growing sense of disenchantment, which is very obvious, it's obvious enough that there's lots of books written about it, and you know we think that's why someone like Trump could ta tap into that discontent. So I'll fix you up, you know. Uh, we saw the same thing not just in the UK but in Europe. You know, a shift towards a more populist kind of uh, framework. Uh, maybe that momentum has eased off a little, maybe because of geopolitical tensions. I'm not sure, but the point is it's still there, and we're not immune to that. I mean, uh, we're culturally, we've we're, we got some similarities there, and we can certainly put our fingers on folks who feel like they've been left out, you know, uh, and so we need to be aware of that. But Canada has done a better job than most on the income inequality front. Remember the very first thing that the Trudeau government did, right, was they, they taxed the high-income earners and they gave a tax cut to the low-income earners before they even had a budget, right? And, and so when the OEC, you know, when you say things like, well, the income inequality has worsened in all these countries, the one exception is 
Canada. Now, that's not to say that it won't worsen from here because we'll have the same tech thing that probably will cause it to, to resume a deterioration. So we have to remain attentive to that. Well, as that's happening, it gives rise to this sense of disenchantment and therefore political alliances get more div divisive, you know, more polarized. And I think that uh, social media ma makes facilitates that. It, it just makes it seem like a higher volume. It makes it tremendously difficult for politicians to, to gather a consensus around and, okay, here's the policy we've all agreed on, we're going to do. Just, you know, look what Biden's going through, you know, to try and try to address the income inequality issue. Like, he's negotiating and not getting very much progress on it, all right? Just, just politically really hard. That to suggest to me, I, I get kind of this dismal conclusion, which is I don't think politics is going to become more effective. I think it's going to become less effective through time. And so, to, and to top of that off, the, the public debt is a, is a legacy of the pandemic, so not much room to maneuver fiscally. And interest rates will remain really low because of the demographic point I made before. So central banks don't have a lot of room to maneuver. So who's supposed to take care of all the risk that shows up and it could destroy our businesses? Not those folks. That's why I'm saying, it's the bottom line of the book, that it's a new age of uncertainty or the next age of uncertainty is going to wash up on your doorstep. And therefore, you need to be thinking about how you will manage it. And it's, it's not just companies, when we're talking mostly to companies tonight, but well, that's when I realized things weren't sitting still. I realized this is going to matter a lot to households too, right? The, the, the decision to buy a home, have a big mortgage. There'll be so much more volatility in employment and lots of churn, searching for new jobs, and you know, all that kind of stuff. That it's going to make all those decisions much riskier than in the past. How will they react? So that's what the other half of the book is. It's about adapting. And what sort of directions would it take? Um, so... I've gone along too long with your question. You've prompted, you know, basically a, a stream that allows me <laughs> to summarize the. But 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 I think it means that companies will need to be more of the kind of social leaders in this respect. And I think, and it'll be in your interest to do so. If you if you're going to have a shortage of workers, especially the skilled ones, how do you how do you attract and retain? Well, I know the biggest risk you face is that you might lose your job because I've got a volatile business, so I got your back. I know there's EI programs and all that stuff, but I'm gonna make sure you get a little extra because I want you to be there after the, after the downturn's over. I wanna keep you. Or I know the biggest decision you face is deciding to own a home instead of renting a home. Um, how about if I have a word with the bank and you know I'm there in case we go through six months where you are constrained? I think those there will be this broader sense of we're in this together from companies and their employees. And that's what I meant about the power shifting to the employee from the employer. And I think your shareholders will reward you if you can maintain a stable and productive and loyal workforce. So that will be another way in which you get paid. More of a partnership. Yeah. Yes. And if you want, you can just sit on your hands and wait till they unionize, which I think would be a less <laughs> desirable path, uh, at least based on history. I mean, it's not necessarily less desirable, but, but I think historically it shows that that kind of confrontational thing, it can work, has worked for long periods, but of course it has not worked in certain key periods. I'm an Oshawa boy. I grew up with you know, people like Bob White and Buzz Hargrove and watched my town get laid waste. Uh, by what I thought was, I called it generous motors in my book, because that's what we called it when I was a kid. And uh, I think it kind of got overdone, you know, it was, and it made them very vulnerable. And, uh, well, now we see, now, of course, they're rejuvenated, but that's a, a lot has happened between, you know, the 1980s and today. Uh, and so... We shouldn't have to have all of that in order to survive this next industrial revolution. Thank you. That's great. James, you want to close this out? Sure. Thank you, Stephen, I did buy your book. Oh, it was, oh, thank you, James. I think I might just... Did you buy you Dalio? Read it. Well, you I think gotta... I'm going to wait for the movie to come out on Ray Dalio's. Okay. But, uh... It's a lot bigger and... <laughs>
heavier. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm working on it myself. At I least haven't there, there were no economic models in here. That's what I loved about them. Yeah. No economic, what was it, the statistical modeling with yeah. all the different variables? And not a single footnote, eh? There were a lot of footnotes. Not a single them. footnote. What do you mean? Acknowledgements. Oh, acknowledgements, yeah, but no footnotes. No footnotes. Not That's once. true. Okay. Yeah, there were no footnotes. It's worth writing. It's worth writing in the text. <laughs> All right, James, we better hand it over. No, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll keep this brief. Maybe I should say I'll keep it transitory. To a couple of people, uh, paraphrase a, a good friend of, of Stevens. Uh, as Leon alluded to, Focus Asset Management is a, a proud sponsor of PEO. And we're proud and we're humbled that a growing number of members in the PEO community uh, trust us to manage the wealth that, they protect, uh, that they've built and to protect their families' prosperity through this environment of volatility and uncertainty that we, we heard about this afternoon. So I, I'd just like to say on behalf of our partners, thank you very much to the dynamic PEO team for putting on this spectacular event this afternoon. Uh, and of course, thank you so much to, to Stephen Polis for being here as our, our special keynote and, and sharing your unique perspectives on some of the, the risks and, and the uncertainties that we're all seeing in, in our businesses in financial markets and, and the world at, at large, really. And even as these risks are, are daunting, I thought you made a, a very interesting admonition, which is almost to say, hey, don't forget about the opportunities. And in an environment of risk, there are always going to be opportunities uh, to be had. And, and I think hearing the discussion we heard this afternoon and hearing the insights and perspectives of somebody with your level of knowledge and, and experience, uh, we're all better equipped now uh, to meet those challenges and to, to go out and, and find some of those opportunities. Uh, finally, thank you all, uh, everyone in attendance, for joining us this afternoon. We, we hope you enjoyed the evening and you'll stay a little while with us uh, longer to maybe discuss and debate what we heard or at least have a glass of wine, maybe. Uh, on that topic, I'm not saying that we might have gone a little over budget on the food and beverage <laughs> spend, but if you are, you know, if you're thinking that used car prices and gasoline are showing signs of inflation, you should see what tempura shrimp and charcuterie is going for in this place. So. I am hungry. <laughs> yeah. So please uh, do. And CB, you have a flight till 11 o'clock tonight. Oh, well, we I'm got good. time. We, we just can drink some wine yeah, and eat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Nothing left for the, uh, no leftovers tonight. That's perfect. Saddle so, up. Please uh, avail yourself of the refreshments. And uh, with that, we hope you have a great evening and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Okay. That's Thank awesome. You. Focus Asset Management is a progressive wealth management firm. We strike a fine balance between embracing new investment ideas while holding firm to the principles which have resulted in long-term success. Trust and reputation are central to everything we do. We're employee-owned, we have investing in our DNA, and we invest exclusively alongside our clients. We offer investment strategies across multiple asset classes, including public and private options, which gives us the ability to meet your investment objectives. Our relationship with clients ranges from a single investment strategy mandate all the way to a comprehensive family office approach. We look forward to starting the conversation with you.